This Week in Parasitism is brought to you by the American Society for Microbiology at microbeworld.org slash twip. This Week in Parasitism, episode number 63, recorded on November 5th, 2013. Hi, everybody. I'm Vincent Racaniello, and I would like to introduce Dixon de Palmier. Hello, Vincent. It's election day here in the United States. So it is. In every state? Uh, I believe so. You're in New Jersey, which is where you and I live. The governor is up. Yeah. That's right. Chris Christie. Is any part of Congress up? Uh, good question. We are ignorant. I think if they are, <laughs> uh, we don't know of them. <laughs> I can think of a lot of people that I wish were up for election right now because I know they wouldn't get reelected, but that's another that's another story. I don't think we had any senators or congressmen in New Jersey. but there We did have a state. senator in New Jersey. Yes, oh, we did. It was a special ago. election, and we elected Cory Booker. Right. And we have to, re- to replace Senator Torricelli. Oh, Lautenberg, he died. Oh, Lautenberg, sorry, Lautenberg. Sorry. Um, See, but we did elect. What I think year is this? Some state <laughs> senators are up for election today. Right. All right. Today is uh, very shortly after episode sixty-two. You and I last week, Dixon. Yes. Heard a seminar by Beatrice Hahn. We did. Who is a professor at the University of Pennsylvania? That's right. It was a superb lecture, by the way. Very superb. It was. Clear, lucidly presented on the origins of two major infectious diseases. Would that One be? is the SIV to HIV jump, mm-hmm. and the other one is the jump of Plasmodium falciparum from great apes to humans. Right. Now, a, a few things here, Dixon, the SIV to HIV jump. We've talked about that on TWIV. We have. There's a great book that talks about it, too, yes. The Origin of AIDS That's by right. Jacques, Jacques Pepin. There you go. Jacques Pepin? You mean the chef no, talks I, about the origin of AIDS? No. <laughs> That's Kitchen it. AIDS, the origin of Kitchen AIDS, perhaps, but not <laughs> other AIDS. <laughs> Jacques Pepin, is that his name? That is his name. No, that's the chef. I know, that's what I'm saying. You just mentioned his name as uh, Jacques Pepin. I, there must be another name. It's that not I'm... Jacques Pepin, it's... Um, it is, mm. <laughs> My, you know, I have read this book and it's wonderful. Well, and, we believe uh, you. We Jacques definitely. Jacques Pepin, that's his name. Okay. Really? He's not the chef. He's a physician. How very interesting. A same name as a, as a chef. That's anyway, fantastic. Uh, Beatrice Hahn is the <coughs> scientist, uh, or one of the many who pinpointed SIV in chimps right. as the origin of HIV in humans. Right. And her daughter was the TA for my course. That's uh, a small world. Semester. Isn't that a small world? In fact, both uh, her mother, Beatrice Hahn, and her father are virologists. Also, that's a very small world. In fact, yesterday she interviewed here for medical school. It's a microscopic You didn't interview world. her, did no, apparently you? Apparently not. <laughs> apparently not. I would have heard. <laughs> no. yeah. Well, I don't interview on Mondays. I have to pick a day of the week oh, to interview. So my Monday. day is Tuesday. And why do I pick that day, Vincent? Wait. Pick Tuesday to interview? Always. I've always to conflict with TWIP, probably. No, that's silly. <clears throat> no, because I get one day a year off, and that is Monday today. What do you mean you get what one is year today? Year? Election day. There you go. But you're here. But of course I'm here. But I'm not interviewing today. Man, this is way too confusing. No, Let's do it's some not. science. So you, if, you, if you pick Tuesday, you know at least you get one day off. <laughs> All right. So uh, after Beatrice Hans' talk, yes. I said, Dixon, we have to do the story of. Yeah. Of uh, malaria emergence yeah, that's right. that she's that's contributed right. to. Now, she's not a parasitologist, right? No. She admitted that freely and openly to the crowd. And she also said she's only been working in this field of malariology for the last two years. So it's really a recent thing for her. The first, pa- I have a series of papers by uh, her and her collaborators. And uh, I'd like to go through some of them and get your comments, Dixon. Sure. Of course. And the first one is a Nature paper. Right. I think this might have been pointed out to us some time ago, but it was published in 2010. Right. It's called The Origin of the Human Malaria Parasite Plasmodium falciparum in Gorillas. Right. And I have to point out that in addition to Beatrice Hahn, 
who's the senior author. Yep. And George Shaw. Yep. Um, a fellow named Philip Kranzuch is here, and he was on a TWIV that I did at Harvard in the virology cool. department not too long ago. Look at that. There are lots of connections. This. I wonder you know? if this was like a rotation <laughs> or something. Isn't that cool? Let's see. He's got eight. Great. Anyway, it's a big collaboration between right. many institutions. Right. Now, basically, here's the background, Dixon. Let me see if I get this right. Okay. Let's Five go. plasmodium species are known to infect humans. I know one, plasmodium falciparum. Correct. I know ovale. Okay. Because you drew an oval before <laughs> when you were trying to prompt me. <laughs> this right? is true. There is Nolsey. No, Nolsey, yes. Um, so I'll give you some hits for the other ones, too. Wait a minute. <laughs> um, uh, right, can I? No, that's no, a, it's an no, ape no, one. No, that's right. I've got three, right? So there's a lookalike to Ovale, uh -huh. which is... Did I say Nolsey? You did. Uh, Malariae. That's Pim another one over Pim here. Malariae. You're absolutely right. And, and I, finally... I can't remember the last one. What are you doing? Acting like a clown? I'm, no, I mean lively. Uh, what is lively. it? That's P lively. P. Lively? Vivax. That's what it means in Latin. Uh, vivax means lively? Yes. Vivacious. That's anyway. where that word vivacious comes from. Okay. So what's the, of all these five, which one infects the most people and is the most serious? Well, in the old days, it used to be vivax. And then oh, a switch. What's the old days? Well, that's before chloroquine resistance. Oh. Mm -hmm. Back before the Vietnam War. So after the Vietnam War. Uh, because resistance arose in Southeast Asia mm -hmm. as a result of abuse and use of chloroquine as a as a curative. It's not a preventative. It's a curative, all right? It will cleanse you of parasites. It will, except for your liver stage. Mm, it doesn't touch the liver at all. But fortunately for us, the most serious form of malaria is falciparum. All right. Now you need to just give us a two-minute... Sure, summary of the sure. of the life cycle. We got a mosquito Anopheles species. Got an Anopheles mosquito. The genus Anopheles mm -hmm. is, or Anopheles, I should say, is the worldwide genus that transmits malaria from person to person. It's the only one. It's the only one. Anopheles, not That's Aedes right. aegypti. That's not an Anopheles, is it? How about it's a, a culicine? How about, a, how about um, Albopictus? No. That's another Aedes. So the Anopheles are bent when they sit on they your They sit skin. at a 45-degree angle. They're pretty easy to tell. Like your car. That's right. <laughs> like my car. That's right. <laughs> All right. Anopheles, they have sporozoites in them. They do. Are they multiplying in the mosquito? They do. Mm. In fact, the mosquito turns out to be the definitive host for malaria. Wait a minute. Definitive host? Yes. And what's a human? The intermediate host. And so what's what the reservoir the, what's host? The, that's another animal that can uh, obtain the same stages do we as know, you. Do we know what it is? Great for? apes. They're great apes. Are you sure? Well, for Noel's eye. Ah, uh, Noel's eye. Fine. For Vivax. For, 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 for Vivax. All right. But no, no, we aren't. You asked me to do the life cycle. So oh, wait, why wait, wait, is wait. the mosquito the definitive host? <clears throat> this is a review. You, you can, you can kill me in This Week in Virology on but this I one. can't kill you here. <laughs> no, because you just asked me to tell you the seven replicative cycles of viruses, and I'm going to screw one of them up at least. But the point is that, that um, the sexual stages of plasmodia are found in the mosquito only. The pre-sexual pre okay. stages are found in the bloodstream. Pre -sexual. But the sexual stages are found the gametes the zygotes the yeah. the bringing together of these two haploid elements occurs in the gut tract of the mosquito not in people or in any other animal no it, it, in a cold-blooded invertebrate the mosquito okay so Arthur a definitive problem. host is by definition that in which the sexual stages occur there you go. So if a you plus. have a, an organism without a sexual stage ah. then there's no definitive host apparently not all right so the mosquitoes have the sporozoites. They bite you. Yeah, well, they got the sporozoites because the parasites came together in the gut tract of the mosquito, Which right? they picked up from someone. And one of the flagellums, which is not really a flagellum, but it's actually a, it's a sperm-like element, yeah. infects or fertilizes the my macrogametocyte. And the next thing you know, you've got a zygote called the ookinete. 
Okay. And the ookinete has a motility aspect to it, mm -hmm. which allows it to crawl between the cells of the gut tract of the mosquito and come to rest underneath the membrane that holds those gut cells together. And there it undergoes reduction in division. Okay. Back into a haploid organism called the sporozoite. And the sporozoites stay on these oocysts. They're called oocysts. Mm -hmm. And if you dissected out a mosquito with oocysts, you could easily see them because there are these large bulges on the outside of the uh, surface of the uh, stomach of the mosquito. Okay. So the sporozoites, as they're produced, can actually get out of the oocysts mm -hmm. and get into the hemolymph. And somehow they find their way to the salivary glands of the mosquito, which is the business end of the hypostyle, which it uses to insert into a victim to suck blood. So the mosquito is feeding on blood, yep. which means it's Not a female. Not feeding on blood. It doesn't feed on blood. Remember, it doesn't it eat takes blood. It, up. it takes it up. It takes it up. It, they call it feeding, but they're wrong because the blood is not being used for food. Is it going into the stomach? It's going into the stomach and all of the Whatever protein. Whatever goes in my stomach is used for food. <laughs> I know, but this is an unusual <laughs> behavior because you're not a cold-blooded invertebrate, are you? Yeah, some you're a cold-blooded invertebrate. Some people think I am, yeah. <laughs> That was a joke. Sorry. You're a warm-blooded, warm-hearted, kind-giving mm. individual. I'm getting sick. Uh, well, well, me too, actually. I didn't mean to say it all like that. But the point is that, okay. that the mosquito needs the protein for egg production. It's a female mosquito. And there's only one way to get so it. So male mosquitoes don't transmit malaria. No, of course not. Because they don't bite you. They don't bite you. So they don't guys, know how to aren't bite. Guys, nice. <laughs> yeah, yeah, we're kind of nice guys, you know. <laughs> so then it takes a, a blood meal. I don't know what they, the, people call it blood meal. They do right? call it a blood meal. You're and in right. the process, the sporozoids go into your circulatory system. That's right. And they make their way to your liver. They don't make your way to the liver. Everything goes to the liver eventually. Yes, but they don't purposely seek it out because well, they, they get, can't. They get brought they can't. there. They have right. no right. means of locomotion. And then right? what happens? In the liver, they infect a um, cell. A parenchymal Wait a cell. Do you have to talk about the circulation of the liver first? Why? Because it's got special circulation. Very, very special circulation. What kind? Portal circulation? That That's comes from the true. Gut, no? Now mm -hmm. you're returning blood to the liver from the gut tract, nutrient laden, got tons of endotoxin from bacterial species of all kinds. Mm -hmm. So it ends up in what kind of a circulatory system? Capillaries? Do you think capillaries? From the gut? Yeah. No. What? A portal vein. They're called sinusoids. Sinusoids. Uh, well, the liver is made of sinusoids, sinusoids. right? Sinusoids. Not really. Doesn't really have uh, sinusoids. endothelium. Those are magical vesicles. Vessels. Mag vessels. Well, they're vessels. they're pathways to they're the liver. Magical vessels. Because they don't have endothelium, right? They do. They have a special kind of endothelium. Called a in Kupfer. fact, called the Kupfer cell. No, no, no. That's the that's the gatekeeper. <laughs> oh, okay. Kupfer cells are gut, gut keepers, but. Uh, gut gatekeepers. That's a very, very interesting way to put that. The sporozoid contains a molecule on its surface mm -hmm. called the circumsporozoid antigen, right. which is a multimer of a four-repeated amino acid sequence, right? And it's believed that that is the molecule that interacts with the receptor on the surface of the sinusoidal epithelium, which allows it to attach to that site. All right. Understood. Because once that happens, it activates the rest of the life cycle. So then the sporozoite gets into the cell. <clears throat> right. And then what's the re what into happens what in the cell? Into what cell? You called it a parenchymal Not cell. Not into the Kupfer cells, right? A hepatocyte? Right? Yeah, they're called hepatocytes. Per the parenchyma, the yeah. main part of the, the liver. The, the, the juice of the liver, yeah, you know, right. like the foie gras of the liver. Right, and it gets in and becomes a cryptozoite? Ah, then what happens? Well, it depends on the species, but if you talk about falciparum, and this is really critical here. Falciparum, okay. Hundreds or thousands of sporozoites can get into the liver. Yes. During a typical... Mosquito bite? Mosquito bite. Mm -hmm. But how many? Only one makes it. Apparently, that's crazy. It is because what happens to the rest of them? They get cleared. I don't know how that happens. Nobody the point knows, is that huh? only one succeeds, usually, and that gets in the cell and it makes a cryptozoite, which is what a spore of some kind. Well, the it's crypto sounds like the a spore. sporozoite that gets in is really a spore. Starts to divide like crazy, mm -hmm. right? And in doing so, it transforms into. 
the crypto, meaning hidden, zoite, meaning live form. So now it's a haploid organism again. It's mm -hmm. rounded up. Right. It's not these crescent-shaped little right. spores white things. And it just accumulates inside of this parenchymal cell, and it consumes the parenchymal cell. All of the nutrients that are contained mm -hmm. as cellular elements inside the parenchymal cell are diverted into production. Sounds like a virus to me. It does, yeah. It's, it's bigger than a virus. It's bigger than a virus. But nonetheless, it makes use of the cellular machinery in order to replicate. But it does so by simply acquisitioning it. It eats the whole thing. It's like, I can't believe I ate the whole thing. Remember that ad a long time ago? Mm -hmm. In this case, the malarial parasites, by the act of replicating and dividing, they need a resource. And the resource is the parenchymal cell. So now it ends up as a large punctated staining unit that you can identify by microscopy. Mm -hmm. That whole thing is called the cryptosome All right. stage. Then, then, then what happens? It gets out of the cell, it ruptures the cell? It ruptures the cell. It becomes so big and laden with organisms that it ruptures the cell. And, and it, now what happens? It releases merozoites. And where do they go? To their blood cells. Right, because they're, they get thrown back into the sinusoidal now, vessels. So one cryptozoite re releases many merozoites? Hundreds. Thousands, perhaps. Okay. And then uh, they they enter your red blood cells. Correct. And they Each undergo one. another maturation stage. Yeah, now they're malaria. Now they're malarial parasites. And here's the other thing, uh, Vincent. And eventually they'll make gametocytes, right? This which, is true, but I want to do... Which will be picked up by the mosquito. <laughs> You're jumping ahead. <laughs> All right, that's fine. <laughs> because you've got two pathways that the organism can take. One is it can continue to replicate inside red blood cells, burst mm -hmm. out of those used up red cells, and move on to new red cells. Right. And the multiplication factor is anywhere from 8 to 12 organisms per red cell, and each one then r invades another red cell. So every time it replicates, mm -hmm. you get a factor of 12 increase. Now, you don't have to go very far in this life cycle before yeah, you get yeah. into real trouble. But wait a minute, there's more, as they say on TV. So what happens if the organism decides, you know, I don't think we ought to threaten the life of this host so much. Maybe we ought to go back into the liver and stay there for a while. Oh, yeah, it does that? No, it can't. Hmm. It has no options at this point. So reinvading the liver doesn't exist in this infection. Because there's no sporozoites, This is important right? for later on's discussion. All right. So there's no reinvasion of liver. Right. The parasites are cleared from the liver as a result of the cryptozoite bursting open and releasing its merozoites. Mm -hmm. Right? Got it. And from that point on, it's a blood stage infection. So this is called, in the liver, it's called pre-erythrocytic stages. Mm -hmm. And afterwards, it's called the erythrocytic stages. And never the twain shall meet. So when you're getting sick from malaria, the fever, what else? Chills. Chills. Nausea. Nausea. Aches, pains. It's called paroxysms <laughs> because you, you go through fever, chills. Right? Mm -hmm. You go through fever, yep. chills, and sweats. Fever, right. chills, sweats. Fever, this chills, is sweats. because of the parasites being in your bloodstream, not in the liver, right? They release pyogenic activity. All right. And part of that is due to the sequestering of the heme portion of heme. So body. why do you... What, it can kill you, right? You bet. Well, why does it kill you? Well, eventually you're going to run out of red cells, aren't you? Uh, it's destroying your red cells. Right? Yeah. The other thing right. that happens, of course, is it starts to slow down the ability of the host to transfer oxygen to the cells and take up CO2 from the surrounding tissues. Okay. And when that happens, Got you can it. go into a coma. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And you can die from this. All right, so that's our life cycle. That is the life, basically. Wait, 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 wait. We've got this branch point in the life cycle. Man. One of them is the erythrocytic stage. Right. That's replicative. And the other is interesting because it can enter a red cell at some point during the life cycle after it's accumulated a lot of infected red cells. And all of a sudden, it's not going to replicate anymore. It's going to do something else. It's going to differentiate into those two pre-sex cells that you just mentioned, the macro and the micro gametocytes. Mm. Okay? Yes. And those are... Very, very different from a replicating parasite inside the is red that, cells. That's what's picked up by the mosquito? It is. And then they mate in the mosquito. They, then they, they digest all the blood 
right? Yeah. Obtain the protein from that. And the rest of the debris from eating, except for the parasites, are sequestered and, and excreted, basically, with the, with the uh, mosquito's uh, excretory system. It goes out into the uh, environment. And, right. you know, it does it by, you know, you think having a, something called diverticulosis is a bad thing, right? Your large intestine has these little finger-like projections inside. Yes. And, in fact, uh, there are many people with this illness. Correct. Sometimes they can create pockets of anaerobic bacterial activity. Yeah, get inflamed, like right. Like C. difficile, for instance. Mm -hmm. And it can erode away those little pockets and, and, and communicate with the peritoneal cavity and cause peritonitis, and it's life-threatening. So diverticulitis is a really serious medical issue. And you can detect it on a uh, on a uh, proctological examination, right? Colonoscopy. Colonoscopy yeah. is what I was searching for. Well, mosquitoes, <laughs> if you think diverticulitis is a big deal for people, you should see what their gut tracts look like. They have diverticula that are as long as the gut itself. Hmm. And those, <laughs> those little fingers fill up with the red cells first. When they take and, a blood meal. Yeah, and yeah. all the other liquid gets extruded out yeah. of the anus of the uh, the plasmodium and in fact the mosquito you, the mosquito I, i'm sorry i misspoke i meant yeah, to I'm say listening. the mosquito i know <laughs> yeah we're looking right at each other right now so that doesn't mean we're listening by the way the, so what is it what does it call when you do that in a laboratory when you separate red cells from the serum it's called clotting plasmapheresis plasmapheresis this mosquito okay. performs plasmapheresis on whole blood to create a packed red cell gut tract. And okay. it packs it away into these diverticula. And the, the main lumen of the gut tract fills up with the fluid that he took in from the, from the blood, I guess you kind of call it a blood meal, even though I don't think it's feeding on that. And out goes the serum part, right? So we mm -hmm. have a great picture in our book of a feeding female Anopheline mosquito on one of the author's fingers, which is Dr. Robert Quad's, and you can see the drop of, of plasma coming out of the anus of the mosquito. doesn't want the plasma. It doesn't want it at all. It just wants the protein from the red cells. And then what happens next is that they start to digest the red cells. So these diverticuli are specialized, they are for, very specialized. in the mosquito yeah. for utilizing yeah. the red blood cells. That's correct. Curious. So in those finger-like projections of the gut tract, the, the red cells are digested. All the stroma are digested. But the parasites are not. And that's where the mating occurs. All right. Okay. Now, back to this paper. Back to the paper now. The background here is that um, until recently, the closest known relative of P. falciparum was a chimpanzee parasite called... Rack and yellow. <laughs> Plasmodium reichenaui. No, no, I want to make it rack and yellow. Every time she said that, I thought of my name. Sure. Which is assumed to have diverged from its human counterpart when uh, as the, as the same time as the ancestors of chimps and humans, which was five million years ago. Right. And then uh, they have re recently detected closely related plasmodium strains in chimps, gorillas, and bonobos. So the idea arose that maybe plasmodium falciparum arose from a cross-species infection. That's right. So that's what they are addressing in this paper. Correct. Uh, can we look at the distribution of plasmodium species in these in gorillas, great apes? I guess that would get bonobos, chimps, and gorillas great all apes, together. That's right. We are the lesser apes, right? <laughs> <laughs> We're the least ape. <laughs> so they did this by polymerase chain reaction. Yep. They looked for plasmodium by PCR, and they also looked at mitochondrial DNA of the host to make sure. It was what they thought it was, i.e. gorilla or chimp or bonobo. Right. Because what they were doing is collecting... Feces. From the floor of the forest, right? Yeah. This is what, these guys are walking around. So could you feces. tell gorilla feces from... Oh, sure. You can tell by what they're eating and where they are. Because if it's in an area that has a lot of lowland or upland gorillas, then you can yeah. obviously identify the scat. So that's they why there are a lot of people involved in this study. Because as she said, they have a lot of shit samplers in Africa. What's really amazing... <laughs> yeah, that, that She got said a, that. I got a bit of a laugh in the, because scientists are so repressed that they don't like hearing those kinds of words. 
Uh, but they <laughs> they listen to them all the time at home, so why shouldn't they hear them? And <laughs> well, whatever. It's just not considered professional. But the point is this: What are they doing looking for plasmodia DNA constructs, as you might want to call them? Although they were not just DNA. Constructs. What are they doing in feces? Well, you know that's how they found HIV, SIV. That's different. SIV in chimps, isn't that? But different? it is growing in the intestinal tract. So it is. <laughs> it's fine. It is. Yeah, that's part of the life cycle. <laughs> not a problem. Plasmodium doesn't. No, do that, does not it? that I know of. Where does it grow, Vince? Well, it initially infects the cells of the liver. Yeah. And then when it moves out, it infects red blood cells. Right. So, and, which and remember, red blood cells can go everywhere, Dixon. They can. Everywhere. They can. To the tiniest, tiniest capillaries, That's right? That's right. But they don't usually escape out into the lumen of the large intestine. They do not extravasate. <laughs> they don't. That's the right word. They don't. Well, maybe through a diverticuli. Do chimps <laughs> have diverticuli? They have lots of problems. I mean, they ate a lot of fruit that maybe have sharp pits to them, or I don't know. I'm just But guessing. what she said was yeah. Yeah, yeah. that uh, the, the DNA of the parasite gets transported from the liver to the bile and thereby to the intestine and then makes its way into the feces. But do you buy that? No. Because uh, then you explain I'm sorry it to that me. I don't. Because I, I the don't liver is it. a brief part of the infection, that's right? That's correct. Only that in the beginning. Exactly. And then no, only in the very it. beginning. So it's unlikely that they would... Very unlikely mm -hmm. that you'd detect that many new infection. Yeah. And besides... It's very, very small amounts of DNA we're talking about here, too, right? Because of course. most of the organisms make their way into red cells after they get out of the liver. So how do you... So the fact is that they did detect plasmodium did. DNA in poop. No, I'm not doubting How do you wrong. think that it gets there? Right. So my, my best guess, if I didn't know anything about physiology... And you or, don't, right? I know nothing. <laughs> <laughs> so I'm giving you off the top of my head. Off the cuff. Because um, her explanation was based on a mouse model using a Plasmodium burgii or Plasmodium ueli. Or, or plas maybe even Lofuri. Or even... No, that's no, bird, Lofuri right? is ducks. ducks. <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> <laughs> Those are docks, ducks. Uh, okay, so the point is that I would suspect that we dribble DNA out from all kinds of sites in our body without being yeah. able to contain it. Uh, I mean, for instance, we, we turn over our gut cells in our small intestines. Every seventh day, we make a new gut cell to replace the one we just slept from the top of the villus. Imagine mm -hmm. how many tips of villi there are in the small intestine. There Not. are millions, perhaps hundreds of millions of villi. So every day, right, we're sloughing hundreds of millions of cells. So that's blood, a DNA. But blood, what about blood? I know, I know, I know, I know. You know, most people don't have blood in their stool. If they did, they don't. they'd be problematic, right? They don't, because they do a test for that. Yeah. you know what the name of the test is? Occult blood. No, it's not called blood. Occult, occult. No, they don't. They look for occult blood, but what is the name of the test? Guyac. Guayac. <laughs> <laughs> Oh, dear. It's my wife. I can't answer. No, you can't. You're busy. Um, so guayac. Yeah, go, it's a guayac. So you're guayac negative or guayac positive? And what does it detect? Hemoglobin? Yeah. That's right. So if you, it's really a crude But it's kind test. of they insensitive take, test. The doctor takes a, a little right. fecal matter on his, his or I her know. glove and just smears yeah. it on this That's cardboard. Right. That's right. So there could be a very low level. Right? That's right. And so what does PCR do? It finds low levels. <laughs> it amplifies like crazy, right? All right that's so what the your whole theory thing is. is that it's some leakage of blood into the gut, and that's how these little little bitty finding. tiny bits. But it's amazing, by the way. And of course, she explained this too: how difficult it was to separate all the DNA that's there in feces yeah. from E. coli. And yeah, they really had to work hard for the PCR. They, but, the, but they got it to work. Yeah, and and, and they, so good for them. They said the test was fifty-seven percent sensitive, which Meaning? means that if you had a hundred. Animals known to be infected with plasmodium, fifty-seven of them would be positive yeah. in your test. Yeah, which so you can, uh, maybe it means fifty-seven of them had blood in their intestines, right? Exactly. Who knows? So be, look at what they eat, though. I mean, they eat branches, they eat leaves, they eat bugs, they eat all kinds of roughage. Chimps eat monkeys, and they eat monkeys. But uh, but gorillas do not. That's what she told us, right? Gorillas are strict herbivores. Strict herbivores. And we're going to come back to that, too, because this does relate to how in the world could a chimpanzee-based viral infection that's transmitted by either sexual contact or by ingesting bushmeat, 
How could that transmit itself from chimps to gorillas? Maybe they fight. That's what she suggested, wasn't it? You've been watching too many of reruns of uh, Stanley Kubrick movies. Gorillas don't fight with chimps? I don't even think they share the same territories. Well, probably not. If they did, though, and you can imagine that... But if they did, but that's the point, they don't. So how could a gorilla pick up... That was my question. SIV. No, no, that, I asked Let first. me ask you this way, why? <laughs> you can't answer a why question. You can only answer how. So they, they took 1,827 chimp poop samples. A lot. 805 gorillas. Collected in the wild. And 107 bonobo. Well, actually, 27 of the gorillas were from a habituated community. Do you know what a habituated community is? I guess it's a reserve. Something like that. Hey, where was this done? Do you know? All over Central Africa. Cameroon. East. Well, Cameroon. There's a very nice map here. Gabon. No, not yeah, Gabon. No. Cameroon. Yeah. And um, Congo. Yep. What's, I don't know what this country is not next to the much. Congo. Where? Which direction? <laughs> I'm to, not looking at the map uh, that you're looking at. To the east of the Congo. To the east of the Congo? There's a lot of stuff there. Here, I'll show you. <laughs> so this is Cameroon up here on the map. There's a lot of chimp in, in, up here. And then here is uh, this country. Here's here's Congo, but most of the activity is to the right. Do you know what? Well, you've got Uganda. Because they don't label it on the map. You've here. got Uganda and then even further uh, west... Or east, rather, is uh, Kenya. So Lake Victoria is kind of like a border. What is, that? is that our colleague talking outside? It Don't is. they know to be quiet when the sign is up? So they have uh, the three subspecies of the chimp, which is Eliote, Troglodytes, and Schweinfurthy. I love that name. <laughs> the western gorilla uh, and the eastern gorillas and the bonobo. Right. Okay. And then you've got, well, I'm not sure about the classification of the gorillas because you've got what we know as lowland gorillas, and then we've got upland gorillas. Yeah. I, I, they just divide them into eastern and uh, right. western right. gorillas. The western, right. of course, being uh, like the American gorillas. So is there only... <laughs> <laughs> just kidding. <laughs> is there only one species of gorilla? According to this, there's G. gorilla and G. burying Beringi. So there are two species. two species. So that's one is lowland gorilla and the other is upland gorilla. And that refers to the elevation. Right. Like some live on higher right. altitudes and others right. do not. That's okay. Right. That's right. That's right. So basically what they found was widespread infection of with plasmodium falciparum yes. of yes. Yes. chimps and western gorillas, but not eastern gorillas or bonobos. Right. So eastern gorillas would be the upland gorilla. Okay. The lowlands are to the That's where the, the mountains are. Got it. So, and they're harder, they're more isolated as a result. And in fact, we learned from uh, part of her discussion that the chimpanzees live in isolated troops as well, and they're not genetically uh, crossing right. with each other at all. They've sort of been fragmented by the landscape that we have created. I'm sorry, Dixon. They say the western are the lowland gorillas. Oh, that's what you said, right? That's what I said. They, they're gorilla, gorilla, that's gorilla. What that's what I, we're <laughs> homo sapiens sapiens. That's okay. our real name. Okay. My you name know? is Vincent Racaniello. <laughs> and you're here Wednesday, try the veal. <laughs> I know, but still. <laughs> now, they say that um, here are the rates of detection. Would yeah. you like to know? Sure, of course. So Nigeria Cameroon chimps, which right. is L-E-O-T, right. is 32%. Right. The central chimp, which is Troglodytes, is right. 48%. The eastern chimp, Schweinfurthy, is 34%. Right. The western lowland gorilla, which is yes. GGG, yep. that is 37%. Wow. Eastern gorilla, they also call them the eastern lowland. So I don't think they looked at any highland uh, Go on, go on. Zero percent in the bonobo is zero percent. Zero percent. Now, what does that tell you? Now, first of all, we'll get to that. <clears throat> okay. These numbers are low, and they say they might even be higher, but they think that detection in the poop is not very sensitive. It isn't. <clears throat> if they could sample blood. Yeah, sure. But why can't they sample blood of these uh, animals? It's hard to catch. <laughs> well, they're also protected. You're not, you're not supposed to invade them. Yes, that's and she true. said they are a protective species. How that's many uh, chimps are there in the world? That's a great question. I think there's a couple hundred thousand. I think it's. Oh, I think they're over level. a million. You think they're over a million? 
All yeah. right, let's How see. about gorillas? Gorillas, much fewer. So I many, would guess that. Oh, I think you're right. Yeah. <clears throat> Dixon. <clears throat> yeah. Yes. I shouldn't have doubted you. <laughs> you do that all the time, though, though I'm used to it. <laughs> that's because I'm a scientist. This is true. Don't trust scientists, trust science. That's true. I, I keep falling back. Population on that. counts. Numbers are disputed. Estimates range from 100,000 to 200,000. Of chimpanzees. Oh, chimpanzees. Total. Total. Total in the total, whole world. Total. When do you think they had a big fall in population? Don't know. Uh, when they started to investigate HIV. Really? Yeah. How they about... Became, uh, they became candidates for vaccine production. The total estimated number of mountain gorillas is... 50,000. 880. Oh, it's so small. It's yeah, they're so going. Small. That's mountain gorilla. Those it are the so upland. Small. What about lowland gorilla? There are more. There are a couple hundred, maybe 10,000. You think? That's what I think. 5,000. Well, that was okay. 2004 estimate okay. by the National okay. Geographic. Remember, I told you once there was a troop of lowland gorillas, 19 of them. They were all related in the same family on vacation, in quotes, at the Bronx Zoo back in 1999. We think that was the uh, epicenter for the uh, spread of uh, West Nile virus. There is this wonderful uh, video on YouTube, which was made by a friend of someone we know, and he or she showed it to us. Yeah. He was in Africa somewhere, and they're in an area of a gorilla preserve, and they were just sitting at a camp, and this gorilla family walked through, <laughs> and everyone just stood. And this guy had his video camera, right. and the mother and some kids... And she stopped and waited while the kids played a little bit. And the guy was sitting there, and then some of the kids came and started playing with his hair <laughs> and looking under his ear. It's and fantastic. All. And he just sat stock fantastic. still. Because any moment, the mother could have wiped them all out, right? Mothers are pretty powerful. If they had made any false moves, right? It would have been curtains. And it was like 10 minutes, they hung out, and then they moved on. Fabulous. Well, so would you have loved to have oh, that? Oh, you bet. Not me. Why? I don't, don't want it. Not interested. Because I don't know. Just kidding. It's like to be different. <laughs> that would be interesting. Um, so they. The, the one question is, why are these Eastern? No, you can't look out the window, Dixon. Come on. I'm not looking out the window, yeah, Dixon. I'm looking directly into your <laughs> eyes right you now. No, no. I was getting a better view. I was just. Why don't the Eastern animals, the bonobos and the gorillas, why don't they have plasmodium? Maybe we well, didn't first of all, it. bonobos in the West. So why don't the Western bonobos? Sorry, I'm sorry. You're right. Eastern gorillas and Eastern gorilla. <laughs> Eastern and Western chimps. bonobos. The Western, bonobos don't get it. Sorry, the Western bonobos and the Eastern gorillas. Correct. Why don't those two groups get it? So I don't know. Bonobos so, are clearly separate from chimps. That's fine, but that also tells you something else. What is what's the difference between the transmission cycle for HIV and the transmission cycle for plasmodium? Well, Did they ever you try need to a pin? Vector, right? <laughs> pin. Well, you need a vector for plasmodium, right? Yeah, I mean, they looked for years to try to pin transmission of HIV on arthropods, hematophagous yeah. arthropods, and they failed. Hematophagous? That too. <laughs> <laughs> That's what I meant to say. So they looked for all kinds mm -hmm. of suggestions like bed bugs are doing it, or mosquitoes are doing it, or sand flies are doing it, or black flies are doing it. No, no, none of the above. They pinned it down to what? Sexual transmission, right? Yeah, sex and drugs. And rock and roll. So, but, um, so these, for plasmodium, though, a vector could transmit it. You need it. a living so, cell to transmit AIDS. So for, AIDS, for SIV, certain chimps do not have it. And one of the reasons is they're separated by river by, from yep. the chimps who do, and yep. they never cross the river. But a mosquito could cross the river, could, right? Could. But mosquitoes also have a uh, sense about them. And they don't just take any blood. <laughs> They're cosmopolitan. No, no. They're choosy. They're choosy. They, they species have specific? species. Species specific? Sometimes. Sometimes. And so it probably means, I don't, I'm saying probably, although somebody out there might know the, the real answer, I would venture to guess that the reason why bonobos have not been infected with this is because the vector that primarily derives its blood for egg production from bonobos does not mm. cross-feed in populations of chimps or gorillas that have it, or they, people. They also suggest that people. they may have parasites that aren't detected by their PCR. Could. 
you know, because they're diverged enough. Could. So. But, you know, by now we would have discovered bonobo parasites because we've done a lot of studies on bonobos in captivity well, as well. And they do a complete workup on them every time. They oh, they look them. in the blood. They look everywhere because so they're worried about something. certain other things too. And strongyloides, by the way, is one of those things. All right. So now we have established that falciparum is in great apes. Yes. So they sequenced uh, a, a protein of, um, uh, sorry, a gene encoding a protein of these Plasmodium, so they can construct phylogenetic trees. Correct. And those are useful for... This was a cytochrome gene, I think, yes? Yeah, cytochrome B. That's usually the one, isn't it? Well, it's highly conserved, right? And it's in everything. And Why so, is cytochrome B in there? Because they have mitochondria? Really? Plasmodia? Yeah, they do. I thought they had apicoplasts. But I, they do. They also have mitochondria. <laughs> and they're weird-looking... And plastids? They're weird-looking mitochondria. In what sense? Well, they don't have a lot of Christie, for Christy. instance. Christie... Governor Christie. And, and exactly right. <laughs> so they, we had two governors by that first name. Chris Christie is now our governor. And, and Christine, Christine Whitman. Todd Whitman. That's right. Who did you prefer? Neither. Yeah, me too. But we're giving away our political affiliation. Ah, they could have guessed. <laughs> you think scientists are all I think liberals? if you live long enough in New Jersey, you don't like any politicians that live there. But actually, my favorite does live in New Jersey, and that was Bill Bradley. Yeah. Uh, so scientists are believed to be bleeding heart liberals in general. But not all of them. Not all, though. There's some very conservative. New Jersey is mainly Democratic, yet we do have it's a Republican bizarre. governor, which it's is bizarre. really weird. It's really weird. It's right. We had two Demo we have two Democratic senators, right? Right. But we're drifting, aren't we? Ah, uh, well. Are we genetically drifting or antigenically drifting? We are. Drifting, we are genetically <laughs> drifting. Anyway, the pl the phylogenetic tree <laughs> of the uh, plasmodia. Yeah. All sequences fall into one large monophyletic That's hard to believe, clade. Vincent, I don't believe this. I'm a creationist. I'm sorry, I don't believe it. <laughs> one big clade, right. which means they all have a common ancestor. That was a joke, by the way. I'm and, not a creationist. <laughs> and we we know that all the human parasites group within a single clade that also infected Western gorilla Quite in Cameroon. So these <laughs> human and gorilla parasites they cluster on. <coughs> Excuse me. The same branch of this tree, implying that they have a common ancestor. Would you, would you call that bottlenecking if you were a geneticist? No, bottleneck is when you have a an organism that goes through a genetic restriction. There was one right? transmission event from apes to humans. All right, so that's humans. the other thing. One. That they believe that this the, that the sequence, which we don't go into because you and I don't understand it. No, well, you do, but I. Indicates that there was one and it. one only transmission event from one. ape, from gorillas to humans. That's a bottleneck. That's a huge bottleneck. That means that they weren't as successful one time out of how many times? Do gorillas encounter humans? Not anymore. Of course they do. No, they do. They do. Of course. But much Diane more in Fossey, the old days. all those uh, biologists. Yeah, but much more in the old days, right? It doesn't matter. The point is that... How long have humans existed in Africa? 50,000 years? Humans? Vincent, Homo sapiens. 200,000 years. Right. And... 200,000 years. Maybe our ancestors... And before that? ...could have been infected also. And there were probably lots Homo of gorillas habilis, back Homo then. Homo erectus, Homo And I'll bet there were encounters, Homo. and I'll bet people tried to eat the gorillas, right? Although... They do kill them. They do kill a, them. it's a lot of meat. So I'll bet there were incidents, cuts and all that stuff, bush meat. Yeah. Although back then it wasn't called bush meat, right? It was just called meat. Meat. Because <laughs> there were no stores to sell it in. Exactly. So one crossover, which is really amazing... That this was quite amazing. The other cool thing that they got from this study: there are six distinct Plasmodium species within the Lavarania right. subgenus. So there are subgenera of right. Plasmodium. One of them is Lavarania. Yes. That includes the Plasmodia. Yes. And in the greater apes, that's correct. So they they actually found some new uh, right species, which they is did. cool. They did. No, no. So I've got a book here next to me that I used as my. My major reference text for the malarias, and it's mm -hmm. ironically called Malaria Parasites and Other Hemosporidia by P.C.C. Garnum. And P.C.C. Garnum is, was, he's no longer with us, um, was recognized as the world's greatest authority on the classification and the biology of the 
entire group of parasites that we came to know as malaria. I actually met him once. And one of our interviewees, Dr. Robert Guads, actually did some research with him during the latter years of uh, Dr. Garnum's life mm -hmm. to uncover the role of uh, the hypnozoid in the role of in, in, in uh, relapses for uh, Plasmodium vivax. So, okay. so there's some some history here, and and he devotes all of twenty pages to the entire of the entire book to the biochemistry of. Uh, Mm -hmm. Malaria, which in those days maybe that's all they knew, but uh, he's got oodles of pages of beautifully illustrated text showing all of the different species. Nice, of, beautiful. It's color. It's gorgeous. They're just these are spectacular. I bet that's out of print, right? Oh, you could. This is a very <laughs> valuable book. If I put this up on eBay, I could get. I don't know, $20 for this book, maybe. <laughs> no, I could probably get more than that, but I wouldn't dare do it because it's a collector's item, basically. I, I should have had him sign it when when I knew I had the book. It wasn't my book to begin with. It was Harold Brown's book, but uh, he he gave it to me. He, he mm -hmm. gave it to me as a present, so I wouldn't sell it for sure. But uh, he's got the classification that you just mentioned mm -hmm. as the introduction to, on, chap on page 109, it says, introduction to the... Mammalian subgenera Plasmodium, Blavarania, and Vincieri. Vincieri. Vin v i n c k e i a. However you pronounce that. Vincieri. That's what I said. Vincieri. Yep, you got it. That's right. So those three are the subgenera, and we only know Plasmodium as the genera that a subgenera that infects humans. Correct. So, and some of those subgenera of plasmodium also infect greater apes, and that's what uh, Dr. Hahn was regaling us with a week ago. Right. Now, a couple of other interesting facts here. They had 600 sequences from um, chimps, but didn't find anything close enough to human right. P. falciparum. So that's why they think it's the gorilla. The gorilla, got to be the gorilla, yeah. It's gotta be so, the one transmission. Now, bonobos. Right. Some. Um, bonobos became infected with hmm yes four recently reported plasmodium sequences from captive bonobos cluster loosely with P. falciparum they think these were human to bonobo infections in a, in a sanctuary could very well more be than that. one in fact could very well be uh, because you know you could guess that the bonobos uh, were the source but remember in the wild the bonobos were negative right exactly we get it uh, a few other things here. Let's see. Yes. Um, when? When did gorilla P. falciparum enter the human can, population? Can we, What's the matter? Can we take a break? Because I just thought of the name of our show. You just found the name of our show? Yeah. you got to get closer to the mic, dude. Come on. No, You're going away. I can't do it. Give me the name of the show. I've never seen Dixon laughing <laughs> so much. It's cool. <laughs> <laughs> oh my goodness! Listen, it's cool. <laughs> he he's never laughed this much. I think I'm. I'm I think you're gonna like it too, though. <laughs> can we use it? It's not. No, profane. I don't think so. Oh. It's called Planet of the Apes shit. <laughs> <laughs> oh, we can use it. No, we can't. Oh, too bad. That would be great, wouldn't it? <laughs> she should have named it that. <laughs> the paper? Sorry. Planet, oh, of the dear. Ape, Planet of the Ape shit? Planet of the... <laughs> Somehow that just struck me funny. I'm sure it's not, but I thought it was. I think it's pretty funny. It's not so bad. Um, <laughs> maybe, we, maybe we could call it Plasmodium of the Apes. Plasmodium of the Apes. That's funny. Okay, fine. So when right, did it, back to our regularly scheduled program. We don't know when this went from gorillas to people. We, we don't clue. have enough sequences. We do not for, have a clue. For, for SIV <laughs> to people, we do, because we have a lot of sequences, we could date it. Right. We can do molecular clocks, but we don't have right. enough for falciparum. Right. And um, whether there have been other cross-species transmissions with other Lavarania which we don't know, so they we said we could, we could look for that. One of the, as, as an aside, one of the interesting features of Plasmodium falciparum, unlike the other Plasmodia, right. is that there are some plant-like genes in the genome. Remember, we had discussed this in a prior episode of TWIP. It has some 
some connections to the other Plant side like of, of the world yes. of, of life on Earth. So if you typed out Plasmodium falciparum and plant-like genes, you could find them. Uh, as a, there's a rich literature on this because they are looking at them as potential targets for chemotherapies because we don't have any of those genes at all. There would be no danger of mm -hmm. interfering with their activity because we have nothing like that. Correct. So that's why they discovered it. And so I remember hearing a talk once at a Gordon conference where the presenter of that data actually colored his mice green <laughs> and showed them in a cage all by themselves. And he said, we've uh, <laughs> discovered that these organisms have plant-like genes in them. And look what happened to these mice when they were just joking, of course. But uh, they were trying to make a point, and the point was well made, that uh, Plasmodium falciparum has some unusual characteristics. And maybe that helps account for the fact that its distribution is so unexpected. If that's the best way to put it, I think it's unexpected and unpredicted uh, from what you ordinarily knew about malaria. All right. Okay. Let's uh, mention a couple of other papers that are interesting. There's sure. one. So that was 2010. Right. There's another paper in 2012 from the International Journal for Parasitology. Ah. You know that journal? I do. Have you ever published there? I used to review for it. It's called Ubiquitous. Hepatocystis infections, but no evidence of plasmodium, falciparum like malaria parasites in wild, greater spot nosed monkeys. Right. Which is a lesser ape, not a greater ape. Now, the reason they did this study is because apparently a P. falciparum like <coughs> sequence was reported in a sample from a captive, greater spot nosed monkey. Right. So they said, well, maybe that is also a reservoir for human infections. So. Right. They screened blood, sam blood samples this time from 292 wild um, of these monkeys, greater spot-nosed monkeys, okay, um, that had been hunted for bushmeat in Cameroon. That's why they were able to get right. blood, right? Right. They found hepatocystis in 49%. Right. What is hepatocystis? This is another hemosporozoan. It's distantly related to the plasmodium group. It's not, it's not a Lavaranian, right? No. Different genus or totally subgenus. Totally it's they in have, the way in the back of the book. <laughs> they had a, and I they had them. one sequence from a clade of Plasmodium previously found in birds, lizards, and bats. However, none of them harbored P. falciparum-like parasites. Right. So these these are not apes now. These are monkeys, Got old it. world monkeys, Got right? It. Yep. And so there are lots of those all yeah. over the place. Many more old world monkeys than apes, right? You bet. So. Doesn't this tell you something also about the vectors? <laughs> I mean, remember, the definitive hosts for this are not these primates. They're the mosquitoes. Right. So look at how many different hosts there are for these mosquitoes to feed on. And they all choose their own specific group to derive their um, blood from to make eggs. I think it's a, a wonderful world, the way it sort of falls out according to speciation of the host and then the parasite and then the vector. The mm -hmm. host, the parasite, the vector, the host, the parasite. And it keeps on going and going and going. And the more we unfold it with our technologies, the more in awe we should all be of their diversity and uh, filling up the planet with life. They say here that the mosquito vectors that transmit AP complex and parasites between monkeys are not known, and therefore their potential to transmit between monkeys cannot be estimated. They're not known. However, for a Lavarani infection of wild apes, where the vectors are also unknown, such distances and political boundaries wow. do not un interrupt the flow of malarial <laughs> no, parasites. They, don't. they say, um, unsurprisingly, political boundaries. Yeah, mosquitoes don't care yeah. about Democrats or Republicans or no, whatever. They, don't. Or they also say <clears throat> the greater spot nosed monkey. Inhabits a wide range across Western Central Africa. Which is why it's so popular as bushmeat. And the pet monkey. So the previous animal that was positive was a pet monkey. Oh, yeah. Probably got it from humans, you think? Maybe. We don't know, right? You're not willing to go out on a limb. <sighs> but they are. They do that every day for their food. <laughs> so the conclusion joke, here... Notice I didn't laugh hysterically at that one. The conclusion <clears throat> is that greater spot-nosed monkeys are not natural carriers of P. falciparum like... Parasites. So this is a negative result. Right. Those are good, though. Those are but it was published. I'm very happy. 
Yeah. And the name of this paper it's in a it's in a um, category called succinctus. Really? I guess brief reports, right? Very brief. <clears throat> Very now, brief. Another paper in the Proceedings of the National Academy this year, published in April, which she also talked about. Plasmodium falciparum like parasites infecting wild apes in southern Cameroon do not represent a recurrent source of human malaria. Right. Right. But there's much more to learn, obviously. And much more work to be done, particularly in well, terms what, of... What did they do in this study? Do you know? Well, perhaps you'll tell us. Because <laughs> you've got it in front of you and I don't, but I can get it in front of me. And so you. they want to know if these apes that are currently positive for many different kinds of plasmodia in Cameroon, can they infect people? Because right. in these areas, there's still contact between apes and people. Right. So they did, they collected serum from people. Okay. In... Um, in this area where there are still gorillas. And they looked for sequences of, of plasmodia that are known to be in, in the apes, okay? Right. None of the human samples contained ape laverinia parasite, including the gorilla precursor of P. falciparum. My goodness. So in other words, these apes are not today even keeping infecting humans. It only happened once no, and probably a long time right. ago. And it might, again, again, I'm just speculating, it might also relate to the speciation of the vector rather than the parasite per se. Right. Now, there's another thing that arises here, Dixon, which I think we should touch on. Sure. And that is they looked um, in this population of Cameroonians yes. for P. vivax. Oh, really? Now, vivax is the lively one. It is, it's one of these, that's <laughs> right. It's party time. What's that By about? the way, you know why they named it that? No. Because it moves around inside the red cells. You can actually see them moving. And this, the others don't do that? Apparently not. All right. Now, they say here that these individuals, most of the people in Cameroon are Duffy negative. Now, what does that mean? What is a Duffy? What's a Duffy? What's a Duffy? Duffy's Tavern? You remember Duffy's Tavern? It's some kind of a coat? No, nah, it was a radio show. It was, it was a wonderful old radio show, um, which went extinct the moment television hit the air. And... Uh, what anyway, is, Duffy. What Duffy, is Duffy. Duffy, there are blood. It's a blood group substance. Substance? Yeah. Is it a protein? I believe in this case it is a protein. Most of them are carbohydrates, but I think this one and is a protein. It's on the surface of the red blood cell? It is. So these might be glycosylated proteins, and each one has a different right. antigenic signature. Okay, so all the blood groups that you're familiar with A, B, R, H, all those are blood group substances. Little C, D, E. There are many different blood group substances. And if you look mm. up just the term blood group substance, you're going to uncover a world of genetic variation. Do I have Duffy? I don't know. Do you? You might. It's probable that you do. Most Caucasians from the Caucasus <laughs> or people who are not native Africans to West Africa have Duffy blood group. You know, it was named after the patient, so that was Duffy. Uh -huh. Right. Not oh. the barkeep. <laughs> so that, that right away the audience knows how old I am, at least, and you didn't even know that. That went right over your head. What went over my head? The, the, the reference to Duffy's Tavern. No, I don't know anything about that. And the phone rings, the opening scene in this radio show. The phone rings, and the bartender picks it up and says, Duffy's Tavern, Duffy ain't here. This is Andy speaking, or whatever his name was. And then he proceeds to have a conversation with his customers. So, okay, so Duffy is not here. Duffy was sick. <laughs> what does Duffy have to do with malaria? Good question, Vincent. Good question. So let's talk about that for a moment. Let's look at, first of all, the distribution of two what appear to be related parasites, okay? Mm -hmm. Let's look at Plasmodium vivax and Plasmodium vivax lookalike, which is called Plasmodium ovale. Right. Those two species, and they are different species, by the way, mm -hmm. are found in totally different areas throughout Africa. Isn't this interesting? Plasmodium vivax is not found in West Africa. You'll never ask, you'll never answer why. I'm going. I'm leading up to that. You have to start with the epidemiologic evidence. Okay. So the epidemiologic evidence told somebody mm -hmm. that there's a difference between 
people who acquire Plasmodium vivax and people who acquire Plasmodium ovale. There's a difference between those people. What is that difference? Those are, those are people that arose in Africa Mm-hmm. On the plains of East Africa, three million years ago as a hominid, and then two hundred thousand years ago as a species, the species migrated around Africa, South Africa, up into the Namibian desert, up even further than that, and established colonies in West Africa as well as East Africa. As soon as the ice ages retreated and the land bridges developed, a lot of the population of Africa migrated out and left, but the West Africans remained and populated that whole zone. So now you have two different clads, or two different groups of clades. Africans. Clades. Clades. <clears throat> clades. Mm-hmm. Okay. So here you have an explanation for that as shown by who catches what. And it turned out that the difference between these two groups is only one little difference. I mean, there are probably other differences too, but on their red cells, there was only one little difference, and that was the presence or absence of this blood group substance that came to be known as Duffy. Mm-hmm. So Duffy, in fact, I know the discoverer of that phenomenon, that there's a difference between these two, and here's the reason why. His name is Lewis Miller. He was the head of the Laboratory for Parasitology at NIH for many years, and he and I were, if you go back far enough in history, this is back you know, pre-Cambrian history, basically. Lou and I were classmates together here at Columbia University going for our master's degree Hmm. with Harold W. Brand. So there's some divergent evolution. Lou Miller rose to prominence, and and the other student kept plodding away in the laboratory looking at feces. He did rise to prominence, (laughs) yeah. He did. I mean, he's... Is he gone now? No, he's still alive. He's, He's down in Washington. Is he working? He is. He's still productive. He still publishes. He's a member of the P. He's a member of uh, the National, National Academy. Academy of Sciences. He, Neither you nor I are. No, I was nominated, and so were you. But that's. But we do have a podcast. It doesn't mean that, though, does it? We do have a podcast. We do, and we reach more people than do. National Academy members do. So there, well, at least some of them. <laughs> Ouch! I just broke my arm patting myself on the back. Yeah, really. So, uh, so Lou Miller uh, was the first person in the world to note the difference and to note mm-hmm. why the difference occurs. It's because of this blood group substance. The difference in susceptibility. Yeah. To so ovale will not P-O- infect... P. vivax. That's right. P. vivax. And ovale, in- both of them? No, because ovale will infect people from... Who are Duffy negative. Stabber. Yeah. But so the, the Cameroonians are all... Mostly Duffy negative. And so that, that was a selection, you think, by malaria years ago? Well, you know, you th- you'd think so. But when you look at the pathological effects of both Plasmodium vivax and Plasmodium ovale, it's not a lethal disease, even in children. It doesn't kill too many people. It's I benign. See. So it's you rather would argue benign. that there's not much of a selection. So how yeah. would it be selective? You yeah, know, could it, does, does it lower the reproductive rate? Uh, you know, probably not. So I wouldn't use it as the same argument that I would use for Plasmodium falciparum selecting for people that have sickle cell trait or sickle cell anemia. Those people live because they can fight off their malaria, that particular species, better than people that don't have that genetic defect. Well, anyway, they looked in this population (coughs) to see if there was P. vivax and there wasn't. They didn't find any in... Nope. You know... Why should they? They, 90 human samples. That's right. What about the apes? Do they have a Duffy blood group also? <laughs> I don't know. A question. I don't know. I don't know. I mean, maybe we should look because then that might say something about the origins of of uh, primate populations, not just people. Now they also point out in this paper, yes, yes. that P. Nolsey yes. infects people. It's transmitted from macaques. P. Nolsey is a primate malaria that also infects humans. So it's always jumping into people. It is, isn't it? So there because it's not spread from person to person by a mosquito vector. No, it's primarily yes, a no, 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 zoonosis. No, no. I, I, I wouldn't you go wouldn't that go far. that far. I wouldn't go that far. But I would say that what's probably going on here is the accidental every now and then event of a anopheline species that primarily feeds on. What is that? Macaques, did you say? Macaques, yeah. Macaques. And then occasionally, when it's desperate, we'll take a blood meal from a human. Whereas, you know, the normal transmission zone for macaques is their species of of mosquitoes, and the normal species for humans is 
Plasmodium wherever you live. I mean, Anopheles wherever you live. In Africa, it's Anopheles gambii, but mm -hmm. there's a lot of other species out there. Dyrus is the one in, the, in Asia, for instance. And so, the, you know, a lot is known about the human vectors for spreading malaria from person to person, but not a lot is known about the vectors that spread malaria from, from primate to primate. So that's why we don't know the answer of, okay. of feeding preferences from uh, their vectors. Yeah, but it, it's a lot of research to be done out there, kids, and in interesting places. Too. So they conclude that the La Varania zoonoses in these animals are not a threat to public health because no. they find no uh, that's right. evidence for them in people. That is correct. That it's is pretty absolutely neat. correct. But uh, they say there's still a lot of diversity out there yep. and other things could be going on and so we should keep looking right you bet i still want to come back to the why can we isolate well, you, wanna, you want to come back to that feces yeah because because that's such an easy test then i mean you don't have to worry about getting blood from anybody everybody just comes and gives you a fecal sample and the next thing you know you've got their history right well it's not that easy i think it's not that easy but it's it's well, they, they were able to get some data. From yeah, but it was clearly, easy yeah. enough because you can't collect yeah. the primates in the wild. Here's what I want to ask you. Please. I, can't, I have to phrase it so it's not a why question. <laughs> so two huge human diseases, AIDS right. and malaria, right. originated in, in apes, primates. great apes. That's correct. Why? That's correct. How? <laughs> no, no, no. How? No, we know how. For HIV, well, SIV, we, we're, we're, we know how. But I think what it means is that Biologically speaking, we're very similar. Yeah, probably that's part of it, right? Biologically speaking, we're very simian. I mean, similar. <laughs> we're very I meant that as a pun. We are similar to simians. We are very So, you know, for alike. HIV, to, some have come from chimps and right. one has come from a gorilla. Right. Which came from a chimp. Right. Did we talk about this in the show before? Probably. How did it get from the chimp to the gorilla? Yeah, well, no, we didn't. And I, I think, think we, we should raise that as an issue because here's something that needs to be discovered. And that is how in the world could I understand how a mosquito could take a blood meal or a blood sample, let's say, from chimpanzee and then process it, produce a brood of mosquitoes, and then seek out another victim for its next blood uh, event yeah and that could be a chimpanzee once and a gorilla once and that's how you can get falciparum to go from chimpanzees to gorillas but i don't understand at all how hiv can jump between chimpanzees and gorillas gorillas yeah, don't I'm, eat it's meat not clear they don't, don't know they don't they're very uh, solitary they don't get into conflicts much it's just like you and i we get along we barely tolerate each other. No, that's not. <laughs> just joking. We're just joking. It's fine. So we don't we don't understand how a sexually transmitted disease mm -hmm. could get between two unrelated. Well, it's not solely sexually <coughs> transmitted. But in humans, it's not solely transmitted. But what about but in, in great apes? In fact, the first. How do the great apes catch it? Do you think? I think they can get it by fighting, also. Chimps fight, especially different tribes or whatever they call. They fight and they can troops through, draw blood. And when we, when well, the, the humans slaughtered sometimes. the animal in the woods to get yeah. a, a no, no. SIV, you know, he or that she part. got cut while understand you know, that part. dressing this. But it's very animal. difficult to understand how this could occur between chimps and gorillas. Speaking of dressing, my neighbor has a fence around her property with yes. sharp points. Yes, a deer. Jumped over and got stuck on it. No, 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 no. That's so sad. It impaled. No, no, no. And it was it's hanging. Was it an impala? Was it an impala? It wasn't an impala, but it probably hung there for a while struggling because its gut was ripped open and its intestines were hanging out. Oh, so she sad. came over and she said, what she do I do? kill it. Said, well, it was dead by the time she found it. Oh, okay. It. But it had clearly struggled, oh, which goodness. is too bad. Oh, my goodness. But she had points on her fence. And our fence doesn't have points on wow. it. But wow. But this is a six-foot fence. Wow. Oh, they can easily leap over but six feet. It got caught. Wow. And so the police guy came and wow. took it off. It was very nice of him because it was messy Yuck. and heavy. Yeah. Anyway, we have a few emails. Would you like to, I'd love to. address them? That would be... Well, I thought they were addressed to us, actually. <laughs> Helen writes, Hi, as a new listener, I don't know whether you've later corrected this or not, but right. you got several important things wrong in describing the antebellum south in the first episode on hookworm. 
They did have machines, and they made good use of them. What they did not have was factories, because they were making plenty of money farming on the backs of unpaid slaves. The first Africans arrived in Jamestown in the early 1600s, not long after the European <coughs> settlers arrived. You said the 1830s. The cotton gin was invented in 1793. It made cotton farming far more profitable, greatly increasing the slave trade until the international slave trade was banned in 1808. International slave trading continued, and the slave population continued to grow dramatically because the slave women were forced to have as many children as possible. Children born to female slaves became slaves whether their fathers were slave or free. Due to its inadvertent effect on American slavery, the invention of the cotton gin is frequently cited as one of the ultimate causes of the Civil War. The American South provided two-thirds of the world's supply of cotton by the start of the Civil War. So hookworm must have been endemic long before the Civil War. There wasn't much more introduction after 1808. However, substantial parts of the South were still under Native American control and thus perhaps free of hookworm until the ta Trail of Tears forced relocation in 1830 and the land was sold for agricultural use. Also, there was slavery in the North, though certainly not as much. There was still slaves in New Hampshire and New Jersey until the Emancipation Proclamation in 1865. Other northern states had banned it earlier. Southerners brought their slaves with them when they came north. You can see George Washington's slave headquarters in Philadelphia across the street from the Liberty Bell. Slaves who got their freedom in various ways migrated north. The American history mistakes start at about 10 minutes into the episode. Thanks for a great podcast. <laughs> well, that's... Uh, uh of course, uh, science is a self-correcting process, and so is our podcast, apparently. <laughs> yeah, sure. So let me uh, address some of these issues with uh, some caveats of my own. One is that I'm, I hope that I, but I apparently did mislead the listeners into thinking that all machines had their origin around the uh, outbreak of the Civil War. That's clearly not what I meant to say at all. What I meant to say was that powered you know, fossil fuel-powered machines mm -hmm. occurred after the discovery of the fuel. <laughs> you can't have those without the fuel. So the very first oil deposits were discovered in Poland in 1854. Mm -hmm. And then in Pennsylvania in 1859. So those, you couldn't have had a combustion engine before that because there was nothing to combust. So what did we have before that? We had steam. Right, and they tried to make farm implements using steam-driven tractors and stuff, and they they couldn't. And the reason why is because they used to get stuck in the mud all the time, so they were impractical. So people didn't employ them. But of course, the South wouldn't have even thought of that because they had all the labor they could possibly use from human sources. So that's number one. And I'm I'm sorry that I misled you into thinking that there weren't machines in quotes prior to the Civil War, but uh, the, the, what I meant to say was that there weren't uh, fossil fuel-powered machines, and that's, that basically uh, created the need for uh, s moving from a slavery mentality to, to what eventually mm -hmm. did happen. I mean, they didn't think about doing it prior to giving up slavery, but after slavery, they said, now what are we going to do? Right. And so what they did yeah. was they switched over to these big machines. So, okay, number, number two mm -hmm. is that the introduction of hookworms, I, again, I didn't mean to mislead people into thinking that they just came in in the 1800s because, of course not. Yeah. They came with the very first African slaves. So that's whenever that date was that you're listing in the early 1600s. Yeah, 1600s. The, yeah. the moment the first African stepped foot on this soil, Boom. in comes the hookworm. Right. So that's absolutely true, and uh, I, I'm sorry that if I misled the listeners in that, in that regard, too, but I think that's about it. That Those are the two things that, uh, that I'm glad we corrected because, uh, you know, we wanted to get it right. And, uh, this is great. It was a long time ago, 22. That's not an excuse. And it's great that someone... No, no. <laughs> oh, no, it's this is great. It's great that someone is still listening oh, to no our question. back catalog. No and question. And Helen, obviously, is listening very carefully, and thank you for the... Uh, Corrections. We appreciate them. I think I cut out a piece of this. Let me see. Really? Dixon, read the second email and I will look for this. Sure. Uh, Anna writes Hi, Dixon and Vincent. I recently started listening to Twip and Twiv, and I love them both. It's been hard trying to catch up and listen to them all. Needless to say, I'm not even close. 
I'm wondering if you guys know of any neotropical parasites, or viruses for that matter, I just thought parasites might be more likely, that live some parts of their lives in both snails and bats. Both snails and bats. In both snails and bats. Uh. You know... I don't know any parasites that live in snails and bats because those would be flukes, although there might be some snail-eating bats. No, some bat-eating. Yeah, snail-eating bats. Not That's bat-eating right. I meant the sna- snail-eating bats. But I don't, I, I'm not an expert on bats, so I honestly can't answer. What about the uh, common literature that we can find on the Internet, Vincent? Do we have any uh, hints that uh, there may be some neotropical which is the new tropics. Neotropical ecozone is one of the eight ecozones dividing the Earth's surface. It uh, includes the terrestrial ecoregions of both Americas and the entire South American temperate zone. Right. So that's the new tropics. Neotropics. Both place. Americas. Then North yeah. America, too? Yeah, sure. No, it's the new world. That's considered the new We're world. We're not tropical. No, but there are tropical regions of North and South America. Yeah, like Gainesville. <laughs> Are you listening, Richard? <laughs> Gainesville. Right. I don't know of any um, snail and So do bat. bats get schistosomiasis, for instance, or do bats get any of the fluke infections that are common in, let's say, reptiles and turtles? And Dixon, do bats get malaria? They do. I don't know if you remember. They do, of course they do. But last twip, yeah, they do. we talked about they that. Do. They do. They must get other things. Even though they have a higher body temperature than we do. Huh. So they have their own special malarias, obviously. So do they get diseases transmitted by normal routes that ordinary critters like, uh, you know, you and I get? And the answer is uh, we'll look it up and we'll try to get back to you on that one. That's a good right. question. Well, I don't know the answer, and That's I hope question. someone out there does. No, we don't. The next one's from Neva, who is our friend in Buda, Texas. Right. Hi, Twip Twosome. <laughs> I like that, don't you? I do, actually. She sends a link to a story about how the U.S. planned to weaponize bats <laughs> during World War II. You know, <laughs> weaponize Ed Young, this. <laughs> Ed, Ed Young tweeted this. What a batty tale. You guys are the bomb. Hey. Do you know what that means? <laughs> I do. I do. I it means so. we're, we're good. Hey, so she, this is an interesting story. This is a story about a guy who wanted to put bombs onto bats and then drop them over Japan. And there's a letter here from Franklin Roosevelt says, uh, it's called Project X-Ray. This man is not a nut. It sounds like a perfectly wild idea, but worth looking into. It's a letter signed by Franklin Roosevelt. I don't know if it's real or not. You need some really big bats or some very powerful bombs to have any effect whatsoever. During one test, a few bat bombs went AWOL and ended up burning an aircraft hangar to the ground. Bad news for the general who parked his car. Nearby. Pretty, Perhaps we should rename the show funny. Bat Out of Hell. It's very funny. <laughs> he just did. Well, I, like, I like the other name better. We're going to stick to it. Uh, gorillas in the Mist? No. I'm just no, kidding. Planet of the Ape shit. That's, uh, that's it. I go for that one. Dixon, read the one from Shane. I'd be happy to. He says, hi, Dixon and Vincent. I listen to every episode of Twiv, Twip, and Twim, and often follow along with Wikipedia to help me understand terms I'm not familiar with and also to check out most of your picks. I also watch Monsters Inside Me with my 12-year-old daughters. I'm up to session two, episode three, and was just wondering if you, Dixon, were still advising on this show, and the answer is, of course I am. And I um, I enjoy it. Uh, it really has um, kept me on my toes because the show has morphed into not just monsters that are monsters that you can see with your naked eye, but also monsters that behave like monsters that you can't see, like viruses and bacteria and yeah, fungi. What right do they have to, to make a show about viruses? Yeah, well, you know, that's uh, they ran out of parasites, I think, yeah. or at least good cases. And it's all about real cases of people that get sick and then get cured. Most of them, they have a few that end tragically, but most of them ended up with a happy ending, so that uh, very interesting co- shows. In this episode, a man got very ill and his spleen swelled to five times its normal size. After a battery of tests, finally a test for leishmaniasis came back positive. Would this be visceral leishmaniasis? Uh, yes, it would. I didn't pick this. as I would expect some sort of skin lesion. Well, it starts out like that, but then it rapidly evolves into a visceral form if it's by... Uh, an organism called Ishmania Donovan. Uh, 
but you wouldn't see the skin lesion necessarily. No, right? it would have disappeared by that point. Got it. Uh, also, they treated him with antibiotics, and he recovered. I'm only a computer programmer, but I would not think that antibiotics would be the recommended treatment for leishmaniasis. Well, you know, I wouldn't either. I, actually, I would have picked uh, diethylcarbamazine or uh, there was another drug that I'm blocking on. The one they gave him was, I think, amphotericin B, and then it I, actually did work. There is some validity for using that, but it's a very powerful antibiotic. So that is a antifungal. Right. Which some may call an antibiotic. That's right. And maybe the mechanism for inhibition of leishmania is not known, but it's still used, and that's why. Correct, they, and they used it also for uh, uh, canthamoebiasis of the brain. Yeah. In, um, so an antibiotic in the It's sense, a, not a general term. It's yeah, a general term it for Clearly, any, if you had something that would only work on bacteria, it wouldn't help here. But uh, They should call them antimicrobials, and then perhaps that Well, would be some people who are in the know call them antimicrobials. Ah, which is a little better because biotic. What does biotic mean? It's Dixon? against life, right? It's against, weird. It's not against. It's an old term, right? By right. S- coined by who? Selman Waxman. Maybe. Let's see who coined antibiotic. Who could be right? Or could coined. have been Fleming. Could have been Fleming. It could have even been Rene Dubose. The uh, word antibiotic came from the word antibiosis, a term coined in 1889 by Louis Pasteur's oh my goodness. pupil, which means a process by which life could be wow. Wow. used to destroy life. Wow. So I think it's time to get rid of that term. I would think. Okay. Uh, he continues and says, Thanks for the awesome work of the entire Twix crew of the entire Twix crew puts into producing these podcasts. Shane from Australia. P.S. It's balmy, 20 degrees centigrade, and it's 11 p.m. What's the weather today, Dixon? That's Well, I can look out the window and tell but we you don't, what I can uh, see. It's cool. It's uh, coolish. It's in the 40s, and it's uh, partly cloudy with sunshine every now and then. And the humidity must be around 32.5%. It's 51% humidity. 51%? Oh my yeah, it's goodness. cloudy. It's 13 degrees C. 13 C. Or? I don't know. I, I only look at C. I don't want to know <laughs> F. One more letter from Bernadetta. Here we go. Here, this is very important for you to listen, Dixon. I'm listening. Dear Twippers, I recently found out when my mum was pregnant with me, she was tested for toxoplasmosis, and it turned out she, she had very high titers of IgG against toxoplasma. That's good. However... She took no treatment and had absolutely no symptoms of disease. I turned out okay, I think. (laughs) So it doesn't seem to have done anything bad. So I was wondering, are all pregnant women tested for toxoplasmosis? And if so, why? Right. So if you're a good OBGYN person, that's obstetrics and gynecology, and you have a young woman who becomes pregnant for the first time enter your clinic, and avail herself of your services. And you are obliged to do lots of different tests to begin with. We used to call them torch tests. They don't do that anymore. Each letter stood for a different group of organisms. Mm -hmm. But toxoplasmosis is certainly one that all physicians that have any sense about them whatsoever with regards to transmission of infectious diseases uh, would think of doing as a preliminary screen Okay, and in her case, she never said when her mother was tested. She could have been tested at the end of her pregnancy or, or at the very beginning of her pregnancy. So the recommendation is, from a parasitological standpoint, as soon as you know you're pregnant, go in and have a test. Okay. Now, what if... If it's negative, what happens? Well, if it's negative, now you've got a little problem on your hands because you're pregnant. You have no protection in you that would benefit your fetus. If Mm -hmm. you should encounter toxoplasma. Toxoplasma could become a very benign infection in you, but in your developing fetus, it would be very serious. So finding no antibodies at all is a bad thing. What would they do? They would recommend the following. They would ask some questions, and they would say, do you have any pets at home? Mm -hmm. And you would say, yes. And they would say, oh, okay, Uh, do you have any cats as pets at home, and they would say, mm, about 25. <laughs> no, 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 they wouldn't. Really, you have a very unusual home. Um, <clears throat> they would usually say, yes, I have a pet cat. They would say, well, don't clean the litter box mm. for the entire length of time that you're pregnant. 
Oh, doctor, why shouldn't I? That's my job. No, no, you'll have to give it to your husband. Oh, well, I'm not married. <laughs> That's going to be a problem. So there are sociological yeah. problems that would so come up. So they want to avoid contact with potential sources of infection, right? That's right. And that would be... That's it? Oh, no. But they it, test you... Oh, it goes further than that. And mm. by the way, don't eat any raw or undercooked meat while you're pregnant. Okay. Don't do that because that's one way to catch it. All Got right. it. So if you adhere to those principles, you'd be fine. And if you did have antibodies... But wait, there's more. Mm. And by the way, you're going to come back once a month anyway for a general checkup. We'll do a test every month to make sure that you haven't become infected. If you do? Uh, then we've got some problems. We have to give you some anti no, drugs? they usually don't do that. Yeah. They usually then advise the mother as to the chances of her fetus becoming infected. Mm -hmm. It's complicated. Now, we, we reviewed this with toxoplasma in the yeah, episodes, sure. but I can just briefly go through it. If you acquire toxoplasmosis during the first trimester of your pregnancy, yes. the chances are very low that the fetus will acquire the infection before your immunity kicks in and prevents transmission to the fetus. Mm -hmm. And the reason for that is that the placenta is very, very, very small. And that's the way the organism gets between the mother and the child. So with a low size placenta and with mother's immunity developing against the infection, the chances are her immunity will kick in before the organism has a chance because the placenta is now larger several months later for getting across and infecting. So okay. that's good news, but the bad news is that if it does get across by some weird chance, yeah. the effects on that developing fetus are severe and usually result in a stillbirth or a termination of pregnancy yeah. by the infection. Number two, if you get infected during the second trimester, all right, you divide up nine months into three yeah, blocks of time. Got it. So during the third to the sixth month, mm -hmm. the placenta is pretty large at this point. And if you acquire toxoplasmosis during that time, the organism has a very good chance of transmitting itself to the mm -hmm. fetus. But the fetus is pretty far along in its development compared to the first trimester. And so it may or may not become severely damaged by the infection. It's usually a CNS thing, and it's usually placking and brain tissue and chorioretinitis, which is a condition of the retina, which also is a calcification of the retina and a damage which uh, creates visual acuity defects. Doesn't sound good. Dixon. It's not good. It's not good. But, but when those ch children are born, and that's called congenital toxo, mm -hmm. when they're born... They do have learning deficits, and they do have visual deficits, but they develop the capacity re to recover. The brain is an amazing organ, mm. and so are the and the eyes may not recover as fast, but the brain tissue can reorganize itself to accommodate these damages to the point where it's almost indistinguishable from a normal person at around the age 12. I've actually seen patients presented like this at Grand Rounds in pediatrics that had congenital toxoplasmosis diagnosed mm -hmm. and are now normal people. So now the third category, third trimester. Mm -hmm. Placenta is very large at this point compared to the first two trimesters. The organism can easily get across. It's almost invariably infectious for the fetus. But because the fetus is so far along in its development, its immune system starts to kick in. And it's possible that that fetus is born normal without any detectable side effects whatsoever. It's possible, right? The fact is that when your mother was diagnosed with toxoplasma via an IgG positive test means that it was an old infection. Because IgM would have been the antibody that you detected early on during the infection. No, it's IgG now that was detected. So that means that it's months to years old. It could even be tens of years old because the IgG levels in people remain high almost all their lives after they acquire the infection. So to say that you were positive for Toxo upon first examination, let's say it was six weeks or 10 weeks after pregnancy, and you had IgG antibodies, there was no chance whatsoever Mm -hmm. that even if your mother reacquired toxoplasma during her pregnancy, that it could ever be transmitted 
to the fetus because the IgG antibody levels are protective against transmission across the placenta. Okay. Now the, the was that a? It's very good, but two, I used to I teach the subject, so that's why I, I had to just questions. go into that first. So that the obstetrician would tell the mother, "Here are the possibilities. Is any are there any options for drug treatment? No. They try not to." Although I think that they probably would opt to do it if the fetus became infected during the first trimester. Yeah. If the mother became infected during the first trimester, they may opt for pyrimethamine. All right. And secondly, the fact that you have um, high antibodies, does that preclude having any parasites in you? Could they be there dormant for you years have and years? The, oh, you have the pseudocysts in your tissues? Always. Always. Because they're not reproducing so the drugs of choice don't kill them. And your, anti your antibody response doesn't kill them either, right? No, not at all. So once you get toxo, active. you're stuck for life. That's exactly right. So her mother had... Has it now. She has the oocysts, yeah. is that what they're called? No, pseudo. Pseudocysts. Only the oocysts are Too many different cats. cysts. I know. I, I insist. <laughs> we, had a, we had a name. We did. We did. Of a podcast. We did. That's right. That's right. All right. Um, she says, my mother was pregnant. My mom was pregnant in 1992, and it was in Lithuania, so I wouldn't be surprised if things have changed from that time or have always been different in the U.S. Does carriage of toxoplasma pose any threats for pregnant women in their fetuses? We just answered that. We did. Also, is it likely that I now have antibodies against toxoplasma because my mother was infected while pregnant? Okay, that's a great question, because what you're really asking is, how long do maternal antibodies that transfer over to the fetus last? Right. Like so here. on birth, upon birth, yeah. you would have equal levels. There would be equal levels of maternal antibodies in the mother as in the fetus. Correct. So you measure at birth right. and then watch the decay rate. So that's, that's to know whether the child actually was born with active toxoplasmosis or whether the IgG levels in the child were as the result mm -hmm. of transfer of maternal antibodies. Now, if the mother had become infected late on in the inf uh, her pregnancy and IgM antibodies only were produced during that period of time before giving birth, yes. then, Vincent, I question, would the child have any maternal antibodies in its circulation? IgM are not transferred, right? Thank you. That's exactly right. So the IgM antibody is much too large. It's a pentamere of IgG. So it won't get across the placental wall. It can't. Whereas IgG, which is much smaller in molecular weight, it's one-fifth the molecular weight of IgM, goes across and protects the child. Okay, so then now, what do you do next? Every month following birth... In fact, if a baby had IgM, you'd be suspicious that it no, was no. infected, right? I wouldn't be suspicious. I would know for sure. <laughs> you'd know for sure, yes. <laughs> yeah, that's absolutely for sure that that child was infected. Okay. So that's another thing. If you find IgM antibodies in the child as they're born, you know they're infected. So what are these cysts called again? Pseudocysts. Pseudocysts. Could they transfer from the mother to the fetus? No. No, so Bernadita is not infected with toxo. As far as we know. And she has no, well, she may have gotten it on her own later. She right. may have IgG now, but she uh, she is not, she said her antibodies would have been gone by six months from her well, they, No, they wouldn't have been gone. They would have been half of what they were at birth. And, but eventually they're gone. Well, eventually they're below the detection limit. But yes. if you just keep dividing a room in half, Vincent, don't you always have something left at the end? <laughs> yeah, we're not just dividing in half, are we? Yeah, we are. The half-life of maternal antibodies is six months. Is it light on or off, Dixon? <laughs> okay, I get it. Yeah, I know. These are great questions. Oh, don't you love questions. our listeners? I do. I've always loved these questions. Do you have a place in your heart for them? I do. Your hearts, the, I understand uh, you have two. It's the uh, right atrium. <laughs> yeah, these are great, and it allows us to elaborate on the fundamental principles of parasitism. It does. Right? And, and sometimes virology as well. And sometimes we get it wrong, too. Yeah, well, that's only human. <laughs> that's TWIP63. You'll be able to find it on iTunes and at microbeworld.org slash TWIP. And if you, you can also find it other places. In other places, Stitcher Radio. And there are lots of other places. Nice. We want to become more and more popular because not we because do. we do we want to be we have wealthy, huge egos, <laughs> but we just want to educate the world about 
parasites. Yeah, yeah, so yeah, yeah, yeah. how can you help us? Go to iTunes and rate the show. Give it some stars or a few sentences. That really helps to keep us visible so more people will find us. It's not easy on that Apple iTunes podcast directory. There are lots of podcasts. And we do like to get your questions and comments. You can send them to twip, T-W-I-P, at twiv.tv. You can find Dixon de Pommier online at many, many places. <laughs> He's at the Huffington Post. You just Google Dixon de Pommier, HuffPo, you'll Only find it. Only done one, though, so far. So I have to do another Let's one. Let's get going, Dixon. Yeah, I know, I know. I have to go. Right He's now. also at medicalecology.com, yep. trichinella.org. And perhaps the most famous, verticalfarm.com. Yep. He is well known for being the originator of the idea of building farms, hydroponic farms, in tall buildings, greater than one story. Thank and you for the he's, point. he's crying. He's just so moved. <laughs> the world is now building vertical farms. That's true. Because Dixon de Pommier gave them the idea and another 106 students don't forget that. yes his students too and uh, I am Vincent Racaniello and you can find me at virology.ws the music that you hear at the beginning and end of TWIP is composed and performed by Ronald Jenkins you can find his work at ronaldjenkins.com you've been listening to This Week in Parasitism thanks for joining us We'll be back very soon. Another twip is parasitic. parasitic.